Good afternoon. For today's devotion, I'd like to read for you a portion of a sermon by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The sermon is based on Jesus' teaching to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. These are the words of Dr. King. Let us be practical and ask the question, how do we love our enemies? First, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. It is impossible even to begin the act of loving one's enemies without the prior acceptance of the necessity over and over again of forgiving those who inflict evil and injury upon us. It is also necessary to realize that the forgiving act must always be initiated by the person who has been wronged, the victim of some great hurt, the recipient of some torturous injustice, the absorber of some terrible act of oppression. The wrongdoer may request forgiveness. He may come to himself and, like the prodigal son, move up some dusty road, his heart palpitating with a desire for forgiveness. But only the injured neighbor, the loving father back home, can really pour out the warm waters of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean ignoring what has been done or putting a false label on an evil act. It means, rather, that the evil act no longer remains a barrier to the relationship. Forgiveness is a catalyst creating the atmosphere necessary for a fresh start and a new beginning. It is the lifting of a burden or the canceling of the debt. The words, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget what you've done, never explain the real nature of forgiveness. Certainly one can never forget if that means erasing it totally from his mind. But when we forgive, we forget in the sense that the evil deed is no longer a mental block impeding a new relationship. Likewise, we can never say, I'll forgive you, but I won't have anything further to do with you. Forgiveness means reconciliation, a coming together again. Without this, no man can love his enemies. The degree to which we are able to forgive determines the degree to which we are able to love our enemies. Second, we must recognize that the evil deed of the enemy neighbor, the thing that hurts, never quite expresses all that he is. An element of goodness may be found even in our worst enemy. Each of us is something of a schizophrenic personality, tragically divided against ourselves. A persistent civil war rages within all of our lives. Something within us causes us to lament with Ovid, the Latin poet, I see and approve the better things and follow worse. Or, Agree with Plato that human personality is like a charioteer having two headstrong horses, each wanting to go in a different direction. Or, to repeat with the Apostle Paul, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil which I would not, that I do. This simply means that there is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. When we look beneath the surface, beneath the impulsive evil deed, we see within our enemy neighbor a measure of goodness and know that the viciousness and evilness of his acts are not quite representative of all that he is. We see him in a new light. We recognize that his hate grows out of fear, pride, ignorance, prejudice, and misunderstanding. But in spite of this, we know God's image is ineffably etched in his being. Then we love our enemies by realizing they are not totally bad and that they are not beyond the reach of God's redemptive love. Third, we must not seek to defeat or humiliate the enemy, but to win his friendship and understanding. At times we are able to humiliate our worst enemy, Inevitably, his weak moments come and we're able to thrust in his side the spear of defeat. But this we must not do. Every word and deed must contribute to an understanding with the enemy 
and release those vast reservoirs of goodwill which have been blocked by the impenetrable walls of hate. This meaning of love is not to be confused with some sentimental outpouring. Love is something much deeper than emotional bosh. Perhaps the Greek language can clear our confusion at this point. In the Greek New Testament are three words for love. The word eros is a sort of aesthetic or romantic love. In the Platonic dialogues, eros is a yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. The second word is philia, a reciprocal love and the intimate affection and friendship between friends. We love those whom we like, and we love because we are loved. The third word is agape, understanding and creative, redemptive goodwill for all men, an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Agape is the love of God operating in the human heart. At this level, we love men not because we like them, nor because their ways appeal to us, nor even because they possess some sort of divine spark. We love every man because God loves him. At this level, we love the person who does an evil deed, although we hate the deed that he does. Now we can see what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. We should be happy that he did not say, like your enemies. It is almost impossible to like some people. Like is a sentimental and affectionate word. How can we be affectionate toward a person whose avowed aim is to crush our very being and place innumerable stumbling blocks in our path? How can we like a person who's threatening our children and bombing our homes? This is impossible. But Jesus recognized that love is greater than like. When Jesus bids us to love our enemies, he is speaking neither of eros or philia, he is speaking of agape, understanding, and creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. Only by following this way and responding with this type of love are we able to be the children of our Father who is in heaven. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we thank you for the wisdom and the courage of Dr. King. And we pray, Lord, that we would have the wisdom and the courage to be able to love our enemies. Amen. Thanks for joining me. We'll talk again later.